foundation of the world that we should be set apart and without blame before him in love so if you look at the word chose us um the word chose us i wish it would here we go eklegomei right mai to pick out choose letter c is what grabbed my attention of yahuwah choosing whom he judged fit to receive his favors and separated from the rest of mankind to be pecul peculiarly his own and to be attended continually by his gracious oversight. They just So there is this choosing, there's this favor and being set apart from the rest of mankind, right? That... <laughs> He chose us, so that's the word chose, in him before the foundation of the world, that which we should be set apart and without blame before him in love. So now where my thought is going back in its confirmation for me, and we're going to start to unpack this hopefully today, or that Adam was chosen. Adam, in fact, he was set apart from the rest of mankind before the foundation of the world um and you know and if you look at the word foundation um that was that's interesting as well foundation is this a throwing or laying down but letter b is what caught my attention of the seed of plants and animals so you've heard me make a quick reference to and we haven't really di dissected the scripture yet to, to confirm to you where I'm seeing this, but Adam was made on day three. And I just, you know, and that itself, that in and of itself is a, a, a choosing, a separation from the rest of mankind. And so in this verse, we see that there, the purpose of Adam you can glean from it, from the purpose of the Malki Zadik priesthood that we are all studying, and that we are to be set apart without blame before him in love. And when you look at the word before him in love, that is a panim to panim before our maker. And the basis of it is love. And having predestined us, predestined us to adoption as sons by Yahusha to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So we've talked about in the last couple times we've met, we were contrasting SA 10 in Ezekiel 28 to Adam. And we saw that iniquity was found in him, in the fallen one, because um, really in a nutshell, he was found to be outside of Yahuwah's will. Because in Isaiah 14, he said the five I wills. And we saw in the way we, we sort of di dissected Ezekiel 28, and we see that he was made perfect in his position, in his pattern, right? So again, going back to um, what I'm saying here in Ephesians is that we can see the purpose being laid here before us, being laced um, with Ephesians here, as far as Adam and the Malkizadic priesthood. And so there is a perfect will for Yahuwah, right? And that will is going to be founded upon love. 
So the being set apart of Adam in how he was made, in, in where he was made, separated from the day six people. And what I love about it is this. In verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. So what I was saying about fear earlier, you know, we fear the unknown. But we also know that the scripture says perfect love casts out fear. So we know that love eliminates fear, casts out fear. But we have to understand that there's a process in between, right? What's the process in between? It is in the knowing. So when we, if we fear the unknown, and you know, the 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 antidote or the, the solution to that is to know, right? So that's why in verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will. So in other words, there is a a, a a unveiling. So there a mystery simply means something that was previously unknown that is being revealed. So do you see how beautiful it is? And so the more I study Genesis 2, the more I see the seeds of it everywhere in the scripture. And I guess that's because that's where I'm paying attention, right? <laughs> so where, you're, where you pay attention to, that's where your energy flows. So what I was saying um, is in, in the question that I had, and what we're hopefully trying to, 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 what I'm trying to bring before you today is that, have you met all of you? Now, James um, referred to, you know, I don't know if you remember that, James, but you said the three walls that we're dealing with, right? So there is this division, um, and there is this body, soul, and spirit that we have to understand if there are divisions or divisions or blocks that the enemy has um, cunningly uh, put there, right, outside of our awareness, we need to understand that those walls have been defeated and, and it, in Mashiach, in understanding the fullness of the richness of his provision to us, he wants us one-on-one, -on -one. like he wants us to be in a hat with him. So we, I guess what I'm saying is we're going to start to make, we, you know, try to see how we can bring down those walls of divisions, right? So that way we're not being tricked, okay? So what's interesting as well with what Matthew Nolan said on Shabbat, last Shabbat, he's, he referred to the two senses that we are chained to. And he says the eyes you know, the see and the hearing, right, in the ears. So there's two perceptions. And he says, only to trust the still small voice. And then he goes back to Genesis 2.19. And you can imagine, and this was in his first 10 minutes, I think, of his, of his teaching. Again, like, what? <laughs> it got my attention perked up. So he refers to, I want you to make note, he says, dust, ground, air. Or sorry, dust, air, and sea. And then he said that what that he used the word manifest or call forth into present reality. And then he refers to dust being made by minerals and glass. And then he takes it to a technology. He uses it as a technology, which is very true. So what is technology that we all have access to that most of the world are 99% dependent on? It, you know, technology is a means to project visions and communications by means of a device, right? So um, basically uh, allowing us to hear and see. And technology uh, uses the airwaves, okay? And what Matthew Nolan is basically saying is, you know, who in the airwaves, by means of technology, the uh, the deep state or whatever, the, 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 those who are against us is trying to project an image of fear in us. And the problem with that is with what you think about, you bring about, right? So then right now, I, I believe that this, it's so divinely inspired that even Matthew Nolan has, has decided to cease and say, I want to be still. 
And now I want to see, like he, he wants to wake up out of that. And, you know, he, it's such an encouragement. So this goes back to what I was saying uh, last week as well. One realization that, I, uh, that came to mind last week was that Ephesians 2.2, 2, it says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. You know, course of this world or cycles, right? So just think about that, repetition, cycles. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sense of disobedience. So I used to think that the power, like the prince had power, had the power in the air. That's what was the way I, the way I understood that. And then Yahuwah brought to my attention, listen, it's not that the prince is the one that has the power. And we know this is talking about the fallen one, right? The, the power is in the air, not the prince. Okay, so, and then he brought to my attention Isaiah 54, 16, and this is beautiful because we always quote, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, right? We, we are so quick to quote that. And then, but if you take one verse prior to, man, this is amazing. It says, behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. But then Yahuwah says something else here at the same time, the same sentence. He says, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. And then he says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So what I'm saying is, this, you know, if you look at the virus, uh, the vaccination and all the chemtrailing, what the fluoride in, in, in the water, the genetically modified food, even, um, you know, like uh, the Hadron Collider, you know, these are all instrument of, of the work of the enemy. And, you know, what he's doing, he's trying his best to blow. <laughs> the power of the air. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second, but I just want us to understand that at the same time, though, Yahweh created the spoiler to destroy that. You see? So Yahweh created the, power, the, the prince or the Ethetan, right? But at the same time, he also created the spoiler to destroy. So what do I mean by blowing? So the power is not in the it's not in the prince, but the power is in the air. So Yahuwah is the only one that creates air, right? So we, we see in Genesis 2, it says, and he breathed, he blew, he nafach, nafach, sorry, I, the, he blew the breath, the nashama of life into Adam. So take note of the action word blue, right? Okay, so... Revelation 13, 15, it's interesting that it also says the, the beast, I think this is referring to the second beast. The second beast was granted power. We know that that power was granted by the dragon, right? To give breath. And if you look at the Greek of breath, it is basically to blow. So the, the power is not in the prince, but it is in the breath, it's in the blowing, okay? And then Mark 4.39, um, you know, when Yahusha was on the boat, he was crossing on the other side with the disciples. Um, we know that there was something that took place that even the very well-trained, skilled fisherman was scared of. Because all of a sudden, you know, there's a strong wind that came about, right? And then Yahusha arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. Okay, and it's interesting, the be still in Greek is to cover mouth, like shut up wind, right? Kind of like what he's saying. But it's interesting, the wind there is anemos, which is, it means wind, violent agitation and stream. And then, you know, if you look at Revelation 7, Revelation 7 is interesting because, and you know that this is in the ceiling of the remnant, right? The 144,000. We see that, you know, there is the four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, the wind that the wind should not blow 
Look at that word blow again, right? And what is the blowing going to do? You skip to verse 3. It says, don't harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. So there's something about the blowing. So point being is the power is not in the prince, but it is in uh, whoever is ruling over the air. So we know that uh, Yahuwah gave Adam that rulership when he breathed the nashama of life into him. But we also know that something's taken place, you know, that resulted in the fall. And all of a sudden, there is a, a temporary shift in rulership. So now the power, the prince of the power of the air is at play. And how um, um, crafty is it that, you know, that the enemy has used the airwaves to project, to seed things into our minds, into our hearts, right? So if you look at what's happening is there's a subjugation of fear. Um, and if you look at the airwaves, I think we were talking about it, Sister Julia, earlier, there's two inputs, right? There's the sight, two ears, two, two eyes. So two seed thoughts, right? But we have to understand that there, it, the, the, the seeding takes place from external, from the air, and also from within. And what happens is it enters the soils of our heart. And, and you know, so, so really, um, thought. So I was talking about, you know, have you met all of you? So there is a conscious part of you. And there is a subconscious part of you. And there's an unconscious part of us, right? So subconscious is basically below our awareness. So conscious is what you're conscious of. So right now, thoughts. You're thinking, you know, thoughts is basically energy, right? So what we're thinking is being processed in our subconscious, below our awareness. And so if thought is energy, that thought that we see with is being processed in a form of energy, energy in motion. That's why it's called emotion. So emotion is energy in motion. So that's being processed in our subconscious, right? And then unknowingly, absolutely unconscious to us, the output is flesh. So the output is, it manifests, you know, in our flesh. So really, what, like what Matthew was saying, the dust or the, you know, the, the technology, um, the AI, these are all uh, a means a, a, a vessel, right? And if you look at a ship, how, how does a ship get moved? I mean, through the blowing of the wind, right? So when Adam was created, Adam had a, a big part of him that was below his conscious awareness that Yahuwah is seeking to harness, to manifest the fullness of the word, of his word, and that is to bring about the inner rulership or the energy inside Adam. And that is by the power of the nashama breathed into him. So that's not by force. That is done by his own free will. So that we will no longer be like children. Like Ephesians 4 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of man, in the cunning craftiness, right? And it says we are to speak the truth in love so that we, that is a, an evidence, it's a evidence of growing up, maturing in all things into him who is the head, Mashiach. So, you know, there is, and the word wind there is the same wind, Enamo used in uh, Mark 4 and, you know, that, that, that wind that seems to be harnessed by the prince of the power of the air. So the power is not in the prince, but it is in the air. But point being is that we were given that, <laughs> you know, and, and it's so clear, you know, in the blowing of the Nashama into Adam's nostrils, right? So what I want to, what I'm trying to say is this, Adam, and we're going to see this, Adam is being nurtured. 
Adam is being trained to be like his father, his Ab, Abba, who is love. Yahuwah is love. And so we know that perfect love casts out fear. But then there's a process in between that needs to take place. And that is in the knowing of the unknown or the mysteries. And so by him knowing, by Adam knowing his nature, really, because there's a part of him that at, at one point he didn't know. And, and what is that? And, that, and that's going to be revealed in the unfolding of the story of in the garden. There's a part of Adam that is capable of birthing sin. And it brings about transgression. And ultimately, it, it puts him in iniquity, which is really being outside of the will of Yah, just as, as Satan did, right? But through a lesson of inner revelation, you know, and I keep saying inner because you're going to see why, you know, Adam is being set up so that he can be, he can meet um, mercy and truth. He can play out mercy and truth. And that we know from Proverbs says it purges iniquity. So that's why in Psalms 85, it says mercy and truth are met together. You know, in Hebrew, that's to join, to encounter, to meet so when Adam was first made, we know that the woman wasn't around. The woman was in him, right? But for him, for Yahweh to use Adam to establish uh, the kingship and to, to establish the throne and to purge iniquity, there has to be a meeting of mercy and truth. Because when, when mercy and truth encounters one another, righteousness and shalom is kindled or you know in in hebrew it's nashak it's to be equipped to make a fire so there's a reason why adam is being prepared was put in the garden and there's a reason why he was put there on day three right um and so i, I just think maybe we go to <clears throat> isaiah 61 because if you look at uh, isaiah 61 hmm, i love it because here you gotta it's quite subtle and i know this speaking of yahusha right but we know that adam is a type of him who is to come paul says but there's a purpose that yahuwah in, hid in isaiah 61 that i want to take and for us to consider right so the spirit of yahuwah is upon me because yahuwah is anointed or chosen so adam is chosen right and there's all that beautiful stuff, you know, to preach the good tidings and stuff like that. I just want to skip that a little bit here. That they may be called the trees of righteousness. I want you to think. And the planting of Yahuwah, that he may be glorified. I'm just pointing that out to your awareness because I want to, I just want you to remember that when we go back to Genesis 2. So that they may be called the trees of righteousness and the planting of Yahuwah. And then here, yeah. Where is that? Where is that in scripture? Oh, sorry. It, here, it's uh, verse 3. Sorry, uh, verse 3. The bottom of verse 3. Right? I, I, we're not, we haven't even gotten <laughs> deeper yet, but I just want to point little things out to you. And then towards the end of that chapter, for as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, Yahuwah Elohim, remember that word Yahuwah Elohim, it's the same name that's revealed to Adam in Genesis 2. Genesis 1, there was no such reference to Yahuwah, it just says Elohim. But so Yahuwah Elohim will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So Adam was being prepped, he was being prepped to so that he can um bring about righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations right so just going back to my notes um there's a part of adam that at one point that he didn't know yet that was unknown to him and we know that when genesis 2 7 happened there is this um panim to panim encounter or or Yahu Adam was being formed by Adam 
in a panim to panim fashion, right? So he is face to face with Yahweh. And, and I, I say it's, it reminds me of that spark of light that is seen at the moment of conception. You know, I don't know if you've seen that, the, you know, the, anyway, it's, I, I have a video of it, but if at the moment of conception, there's a fire, fire, fireworks that's taken place, a celebration that's happening because there's a spark of light that is, that was seen um, by the, the researchers, right? So Adam, Yahuwah sees Adam fully, but like I said, Adam hasn't seen his entire part yet, right? So if you look at the word Abba, right? Um, Yah, Adam is made in the reflection, in the in the image of, of, of Yahuwah, right? So Adam is a reflection of Yahuwah, right? But if you look at the word Abba, and you look at the word Ab, and I know this is just in the English, James. This is just in the English. I know you can take this down to a, a, a deeper um, paleo. But just in the English, in the letters A-B-B-A, the word Ab is father, right? So Ab breathed Adam into existing, into becoming a soul, right? So you see how Ab, A-B, breathed Adam into being, right? Okay, I, I like how that's... When when I saw that, I thought that I thought that was pretty cool. And but if you look at Adam from Adam's perspective, he's really only seeing himself. Because if you look at uh, A and it stands for Adam, and B is is really Eve. Is what I'm trying to tell you is Eve that is inside him and on his side that hasn't come out yet. Okay. So at one point when when Yahweh breathed Adam into existence, he was only seeing a conscious, the, the external of him, right? And so we know that in the garden, Adam was given everything pertaining to life and godliness, the nashama, the word of Yah in him. But at one point, this is all just a head knowledge for him. So that's why his state of being is undetermined. Like, so he's not really immortal, nor is he mortal, right? So, and, and so I just, I don't usually refer to extra biblical sources, but I, I couldn't express this in a more perfect way, the way Enoch said it. So second Enoch 30 says, and this is referring to the creation of Adam, and this is Yahuwah saying, whereas I have come to know his nature, he does not know his own nature. That is why ignorance is more lamentable than the sin, such as it is in him to sin. So in other words, you know what? What is not known of us? is actually quite dangerous. Do you, do you know what I mean? So I'll give you a brief example. My daughter, my Rish, my second born, um, last week, she just had, she, in, she met a part of her, okay? She met a part of her that actually was, she just realized um, th that was hijacking, hijacking, was stealing her joy was stealing her true identity that, that she is in the most high for seven years. The first, and this is the spirit of fear, the first whisper of the spirit of fear came about when she was seven. And so as a mother, as a mother who's obviously close to her, I didn't even really, like I had a hunch there's something there, but I didn't really know to the extent to how much of a, of a of a of a the, the, the depravity of of what that spirit of fear was doing to her right but point is that's a part of her that she was below her awareness her consciousness so it's a part of her subconscious so a lot of what she was doing um you know decisions or you know as simple as meeting new people fear grips her and, you know, sometimes you mistake that and you think maybe that's just who I am. You know, sometimes, you know, even the fear, the identity issue steals her, her joy from her. Sometimes she can't sleep, you know, and then we know that eventually that will translate to physical ailment. But the point being is this spirit of fear that started as a voice in the bathroom in when she was seven years old and it's something to do with Q-tips. It's something so silly. 
all these years up until last week she met this part of her so she the what was below her awareness brought above was brought about to her conscious awareness and she met this spirit of fear that was not given to her so when she met the spirit of fear she came to a full realization that she needs yahusha to deliver her from that and and for to, like and i've shared this with sister julia to hear your daughter call out for deliverance in the name of yahuwah it's beautiful to hear and so point being is we all like we are in a work we are all work in progress right so so my daughter when she met the spirit of fear that she had that's been chugging along for seven years she surrendered that at the feet of mashiach so she surrendered it at the brazen altar where it can be consumed to ashes and she's given beauty for ashes right so point being is there's at this point adam didn't there's a part of him that he doesn't know yet so that's why in first corinthians you know we only see a reflection as in a mirror you know then we will see face to face but now there's a part of us that know in part but then there's also a, a a part of us that will know fully that we will know fully as even as i am fully known so yahuwah knows adam but there's a part of him that he doesn't he's not aware of so if you look at uh, adam his conscious okay i, I want to make a comparison here and you can research this yourself how powerful is our subconscious? So our subconscious mind processes 20 million bits of info per second. Compare that to our conscious mind that can only process 40 bits of info per second. So the subconscious mind is 500,000 times more than what the conscious mind is able to, comprehend, to, to process. So if you look at an iceberg, I love this illustration because it's, you know, an iceberg, you what you see above the surface and compared to what you can't see below the surface is two times or three times more than what you see in the surface. So, you know, Adam sees himself, but Adam needs to see the potential that he has because you know, like there's a part of us that's conversing right now. We're talking, right? We're having this discussion. But I'm only really, you're only seeing a part, you're only seeing a part of what I'm saying. But like, you know, like I'm looking at you, I'm beholding your face, but there's a part of you that is two times to three times even more powerful than what I'm seeing from the surface. And that's what Yahuwah is going to harness out of Adam, and that's why he's the type of Mashiach, which is such a beautiful picture, right? And what else is interesting about the subconscious? Um, the subconscious or our soul, let's say, is made up of our heart, our free will, our own thoughts, our desires, and the heart. Did you know this, that the heart is the most powerful generator of electromagnetic energy in the human body, producing the largest rhythmic electromagnetic field it, so it's it is 60 times greater than the amp the amplitude that the electrical electrical activity that is being generated by the brain so if you think about it you know yahuwah is is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth so there's this comb yahuwah doesn't want just head knowledge he wants your entire being he wants you to love him with all your heart because what happens is when you when you combine when there's a kindness when there is harmony in the brain and the heart that just amps it up to very powerful fields electromagnetic fields right so there's that coherence that yahuwah is looking for right so and, and i i plugged that in there um you know jeremiah 31 22 I thought it was interesting because it says Yahuwah has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass a man. And that word in Hebrew is not just ish. That word man is gibor or mighty. But Yahuwah somehow is using 
a woman to encompass a mighty man. So there's something about the subconscious. And, and by the way, what I mean, why I use the word woman is because Adam represents the spirit or the conscious. And then Eve, in, my, in the way I've been understanding Genesis 2, in the, the framework of the revelation of Yahweh that impressed in my heart, the woman is the soul, a type of soul, right? So the subconscious represents the woman. So what I'm saying is there's something about harnessing the power of our full, our full entire being that Yahweh is after because, you know, that just creates power, right? So if you look at uh, 1 John 3, 2, dear friends, now we are children of Yah. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Mashiach appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we're going to see that in the garden story, right? In, in, we're going to see that Adam and the woman is um, being nurtured like children. And you're going to see that, you know, the he heavenly father is so good to them. Because what Yahuwah is doing is training them and equipping them. Um, and we know that Yahuwah is love. So his offspring is going to be love. So, you know, Yahusha is love manifest on earth. So what Yahuwah is doing in the story of Adam and Eve is bringing about um, his message of love, his gospel. And isn't it interesting that in Hebrew, the word Good news is basar, which is flesh. Think about that, flesh. So the good news has to do with flesh. But there's this mystery that Adam now needs to realize and discover because it is, you know, the, the John 15 talks about the mystery of the gospel hidden within, the riches. And this, you know, this gospel basically is the riches of the hope of glory of Mashiach, and that is hidden within, right? And so um, what I'm saying now is, okay, so I'm just going to pause here. I think I, I put that in there because um, uh, the word of Yah is five-dimensional, and uh, it pierces through five senses our five senses. And I say that here because Yahuwah, it says the word of Yah is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. So at one point, we know that Eve came out of Adam. And what Yahuwah is doing here is he's really getting down to the details, to the nitty gritty, the joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart because it is in the combination of what we just read here in Hebrews 4.12 is where the key to, um, you know, um, using the word of Yah or having it manifest as living and powerful, right? So we know that, um, you know, Adam will eventually encounter face to face his inner self, right? So, and that is his inner self, which is also his inner voice, his soul mate. And that took place by the piercing or the dividing of his flesh. And that was where Eve or the woman came out of him, right? So, and Yahoo again is interested in encompassing the triune nature of mankind to the point of discerning thoughts and intents of the heart. We have to understand how power, and let me just pause here. We have to understand how powerful the intents, intents are, thoughts and intents. When my daughter was um, sharing with me her first recollection of fear that gripped her at age seven, and this was by looking at a box of Q-tips, and a voice, she heard something in her, not an audible voice, just a thought, right? The, the thought goes something like this. If the Q-tips were to be finished, you're going to die. Just, just think about that. 
So as a seven-year-old, she's like, okay, I don't want to die. So what she did, she took a bunch, like a handful of Q-tips, and she hid it somewhere. So you have to understand how, where did that thought come from, okay? So what I said to her when I sat down in front of her, I said, okay, obviously that thought is not of Yahuwah, right? We know that, okay. But it came somewhere, okay? So we don't really, it's not within our capacity. We don't have the time to discover where it happened. We just know that it's not from Yahuwah. But I'm going to say this. When my children were young, I didn't know any better. So I exposed them to a lot of the Disney films, okay? And Disney films, we know, is rich of subliminal messaging. So, and it is as simple and as powerful as this. Uh, the artist or the creator of the, the cartoons by drawing and stuff like that, all they have to do is entertain a thought that is not of Yahuwah, and the thought is, I think I'm going to hide a little message here, whether they realize it or not, right? And then they put their intent to their drawing, right? So let's say I think I'm going to be silly. I'm going to hide a little message of fear in this little part of the script of the, of the cartoon part. All they have to do is put their thought and their intent and manifest it in a, in a form of, of pixels or motion picture and the child now you know when and a child is watching you know within five minutes of watching a movie your brain uh switches to an alpha state when your brain switches to an alpha state you become uh you're in a hypnosis stage so everything in the pixels is coming right through to you Right. So and, and this is actually a, a, a true story. And there's um there's someone by um just out of, I guess, mock of what they were just playing. They decided to uh, put infrasound. So 40 hertz or below. So 39 hertz, 38 hertz, 39 hertz is the sound of fear. So when it's infrasound, you can't hear it audibly. So what they did was in a, in a, I think it was a Disney, um, it was in a, in Disneyland or Disney World in one of those shows, you know. Um, so what they did was they decided to uh, play the music and they added infrasound, the sound, the frequency of fear, which is 39 hertz. You know, you can't hear it, right? But after that presentation, Everyone in the theater felt sick for days. They felt like throwing up something. So do you see my point? So these things we aren't aware of is my point. Why I say that is because when we don't know, you know, the, what we don't know, the enemy has an advantage is my point. So now that we know, now that I know that Disney films have, had I known that years ago, I would not have exposed my children to that. But do you see, so am I saying that that's what triggered? You know, I, yeah, I didn't abuse my children, so I don't mean, it is definitely, you know, it's probably something like that. But that's why David says, Psalm 139, search me, oh yeah, know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way. Anything that is not wicked is outside of the righteousness of Yahuwah, right? And lead me in the way everlasting. So there, is, there are parts of us that we need to, to meet and we need to put it under the blood of Mashiach, which is mercy. And lace it and, and have truth and throne that part of us, right? So I guess there are parts of us that is enthroned to spirit beings that we don't know about, is my point. And so that's what I mean by do we know, do we really know who we are, right? And that's why I love going back to the story of Adam and Eve because it breaks it down to something that we can grasp, we can. It's tangible to us. So 
just remember this, where identity or purpose is not known, abuse of self or abuse of others or by others is inevitable. So knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. So the more we yada, the more we intimately know who we are in Mashiach, the greater access we have of the power that works in us. And, you know, I, I wrote down a couple of examples here, like, you know, when it comes to the unknowns about our body, soul, and spirit, what are some of the things that's hijacking your, your uh, joy, hijacking your health, your freedom, right? And I don't think I'm going to go into detail maybe another time because I already gave another example there. But, like, um, so, so going, okay, so now I think, I know we still haven't gone to Genesis 2, and we're going to go there, I promise. But I was just laying down the foundation so you understand when we start reading it, you see it from a perspective of a, a heavenly Abba who is nurturing his children, training him, right? And then there's a testing that's going to take place to see if they will pass, right? Um, but I think it's important for us to to understand the trees in the garden a little bit, okay? So, um, so I'm going to go back quickly to um, the uh, the fallen one, and we understand that he was granted nine stones. Um, nine nine is the fruit of the spirit, so we know that's something to do with spirituality. So he's the enemy is an immortal being, um, but. He wasn't given the full 12, or at least we don't know what happened or whatever, but he doesn't have 12 stones. 12 stones represents divine government, right? So point being is there is something that is lacking in, in him that now Yahuwah is going to, to turn around into something beautiful with Adam because Adam is given three stones or two stones on gold uh, breastplate. We will see that in Genesis 2, right? So in other words, um, Adam needs to com collect stones, if, if you want to, for lack of a better word, right? Adam is now going to collect because now we see in Revelation 22 that there's 12, the 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 new jerusalem which is the bride of mashiach is made up of 12 precious stones that makes up the walls and the and the street of it right but here's i remember we had a talk with sister julia we used the word harpazo so you can imagine when i when i saw this i was i was i was floored so we know that our call really is to bear the fruit of the ruach right we know that and there's nine fruit of the spirit right so we see that in Adam, he starts off with two, you know, on and it's gold, onyx, and uh, I forget the other one, bdellium. And I think it's interesting that bdellium is black and onyx is red. I don't know, just anyway. So if you look at the word fruit in Revelation 22, right? I just want to point this out because this is so amazing. Revelation 22, you know, we know fruit, right? If you look at fruit, uh, where is it here? Fruit, okay. In Greek, and again, this is just Greek. James hasn't gone to paleoing it, right? Harpos is a fruit. We know all that stuff, right? Progeny, that's an interesting one too, which we'll get back to, right? To gather fruit. You see that there, the fruit of the trees, right? You go a, a deep, uh, a, a layer behind, that word fruit comes from the word harpazo. <laughs> Did you know that? Harpazo, or you know, we call that as the rapture, to seize, to snatch out or away. But that's not where I want to go. I just thought that was interesting, and I'm sure we can make connections down the down in, in the somewhere down the road. But I thought it was interesting to see the other layer, which is herio, which means to choose or to elect to office, to prefer, to take for oneself. So there's this idea of election, of, of there's this idea of office, there's idea of free will here, to prefer. 
And what's even more amazing is if you go and remember, this is the word fruit in Revelation, talking about the fruit that is uh, being uh, that we're seeing in the the trees, the tree of life, right? The word arrow is to raise up, to elevate, to raise from the ground, to take up stones. Did you hear what I <laughs> To take up stones. Anyway, that is, you know, I'm so excited. Anyway, so point being is that the fruit that we are to bear has something to do with taking, raising, you know, taking up stones, the precious stones. And to me, that's awesome stuff. And so, and then, and then, where do I have this here? And, you know, we, um, oh, I can't remember why I put that there. I think we addressed that with uh, Jess earlier. Okay, so I'm just going to, so, okay, so Genesis 2, um, four and five we're gonna i think we're gonna go there soon um it, isaiah 61 we talked about that and it hints at the purpose of adam's placement in the garden and again we said that it's to do with nurturing and the foundation here is love so when we're reading genesis 2 you gotta put love in between there's this learning training preparation to preach the gospel or the flesh Basar to the poor, interesting, and to fully equip them to experience knowledge, not just head knowledge, but to fully experience what it means to have mercy and truth encounter one another and purge iniquity. And really, Adam kicks off the Malkizadic priesthood. And I know this is not a popular thing, but I believe that everything that happened there fits exactly the purpose of Yahweh. So he did that successfully, right? And I know I said that and some of you would be like, ooh, I don't know what you mean by that. But yeah, well, but um, so uh, a little bit more here. I said earlier that we look at Adam and Eve from a children's perspective, right? We know there are several hints in the scripture that when it comes to being in the kingdom of Yahuwah, we have to be as little children. So this is my basis of, of saying why we should treat Adam and Eve as children. Because it says, unless you're converted and become as little children, you won't, you won't by means enter the kingdom. So we know because they were made in the kingdom, they were placed there, they were, they were physically mature, or we, we don't understand what or, or the, the clothing of garment of light is like, but we know that they had, uh, the mind or the frequency of children, the brain frequency of a child, right? So also Exodus 19, I, this is the first time I've picked it up. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a set apart nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, right? Children. And then Matthew 18, you know, Yahushua loves children. And he says, he calls the little child to him, set him in the midst of them. So I, I'm pointing this out because we got to pay attention to this word in the midst when we go and examine the garden, right? Because the tree of life is in the midst of the garden, right? So Exodus 20, 20, it says, Moshe said to the people, do not fear for Yah has come to test you and that his fear may be before you that you may not sin or, or that his reverence may be before you that you may not sin. So that's an interesting part because I want to draw from that when it comes to Eve's testing, like the woman's testing, right? So just remember that there is a testing that Yahuwah puts us in to, for us to face, to see if we revere him, if we have a reverence for him, right? Um, and also Proverbs 22, 6, as Abba, as Abba father to Adam and the woman, I am sure, 100%, no doubt, that he is, you know, the word where it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And Sister Julia brought this to my attention from the Septuagint in Genesis 2. It actually says, the tree of the learning of the knowledge of good and evil. 
So I'm just laying, I guess I'm giving you all the Coles notes in advance. So when we read it together, you see where I'm coming from, right? So, so the, the tree, the, the knowledge of good and evil is actually a means, a modality of learning is what I'm trying to say, right? So tree of life, again, this is another nugget or, or just a piece of to keep in your forefront. The tree of life really represents um, spirituality or immortality because we know that in Genesis 3, they were kicked out or they were the, the access was removed so that they don't become like that forever kind of thing. So we know that the tree of life has something to do with immortality. Now, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has something to do with divinity, with being a ruler, right? Because we also know in Genesis 3, it says, you know, man has become, this is Yahweh speaking, like one of us. So Yahweh is talking about the gods, like the Elohim. So he's talking about divinity. So there's something about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that will establish rulership or divinity, right? So there is this idea of learning, okay? So, so maybe what I'll do is, um, you know what, I'll, I'll pause and then we'll, let me know when we, you wanna go to Genesis 2. I'll pause and see if you guys have something. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. <laughs> 